Good evening and welcome to tonight's online event by Saving Devon's Treescapes. My name's Lindsay Marne and I'm the Citizen Science Assistant for the project and I'm joined by Claire Inglis, my colleague and teammate, who's going to be delivering tonight's presentation about hedgerows for wildlife. So more of that in a moment, but first of all, I'm just going to give you a very brief introduction to the Saving Devon's Treescapes project. Just waiting for the next slide. Is it moving on, Claire? Just about, there it is. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. So Saving Devon's Treescapes is a project which is led by Devon Wildlife Trust, but on behalf of the Devon Ash Dieback Resilience Forum. We started in 2020 and it's a five year project. So we're now about halfway through. And we're funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, One Tree Planted, as well as other funders. And because it's a partnership project, we are working in conjunction with a whole range of other partners, both regional, local and national. And you can see the main partners up there on the screen. Um, some of those are producing, providing funding for of us, some of them are providing resources, and others are providing advice and expertise. So it's Apologies, Lindsay, I've somehow muted you, so I can't hear you. Um, I've just um, unmuted oh, myself. You Perfect, you? thank you. Okay. <laughs> I'll move on to the next slide. Thank you. So the reason this project exists is because of ash dieback disease, which you probably have heard of. Ash dieback sadly been around for several years now. Um, it is an invasive fungal disease, which is affecting all of the ash trees in the UK, or certainly a very large proportion of them. Projections at the beginning of the ash dieback crisis, if I can call it that, were that we were expected to lose 90% of our ash trees in the coming decade. For Devon, that's a really big deal, as of course it is across the country. But in Devon, we've got about nearly 2 million ash trees, and it's our second most common tree outside of woodlands. So it's really important you can imagine what a dramatic difference it would make to our landscapes and our treescapes um, if those trees all disappeared. So the fact that we might be losing some of those ash trees, a large proportion of them also has a knock on effect on many species which are reliant on ash trees in particular and on our treescapes in more general terms. So the way that Saving Devon's Treescapes is addressing that threat of losing those trees is by supporting local communities across the county to plant and nurture over a quarter of a million trees during the lifespan of this five year project. So we're celebrating trees, we're helping people to connect with their landscape through tree planting but other activities as well. And we do have lots of ways in which we are delivering free trees to communities across the county. And you can find out more about that on our web page. So the project is county wide, but we are focusing half of our effort in five key areas, which are shown in blue there on the map. And they are in parts of South Devon, Tor Bay and Exeter and Cranbrook as the two big urban areas. The Coley Valleys in East Devon and Narosh or the Blackdown Hills, which actually borders the uh, county borderline into Somerset. I'm going to stop there and hand over to Claire now to talk about hedges, all things brilliant and wonderful about hedges. Thank you, Claire. Thanks, Lindsay. And hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming tonight. It's great to see so many people interested in um, our wonderful hedgerows. Um, so just to give you a bit of a background about who I am, my name is Claire Inglis. I am the new Treescapes Officer for Saving uh, Devon's Treescapes project uh, set within Devon Wildlife Trust, um, as Lindsay's obviously already given you a bit of a taster about. Um, so the main part of my role is to go out and work with different landowners um, and to support them with um, tree planting opportunities and hedgerow creation. So that that's quite um, fits quite neatly into our, our topic this evening. 
Um, so uh, just to give you a bit of a background to Hedgerow Week. So um, this is um, an annual event that was launched in 2021. Um, by the Tree Council and other partners um, to highlight the significant contribution that hedgerows make in helping to halt biodiversity decline and the climate crisis. And the Tree Council is seeking to encourage people to collect lots of different data about hedgerows um, in, in order to, to fully engage with those kind of habitats, to learn more about them, to raise awareness about, about the impacts and, and the huge contribution that they make to, to biodiversity. Um, and to look at things like condition, age, distribution, and so on. And the, the 2023 focus is actually on healthy hedgerows. Um, and this year it does coincide with National Plant Health Week as well. Um, they're also running the Hedge Life uh, Help Out Scheme. So that runs for the, the whole of May. Um, and that invites people to check in on a local hedgerow and to complete um, a short survey form um, to feedback on the condition of that. And there is a link there which um, you can follow in order to download that. So I'm going to uh, get stuck into our talk this evening. Um, so we're looking at hedgerows for wildlife. So I thought I'd give you just um, a bit of a background about hedgerows, um, what they actually are, um, a bit of the history of hedgerows, um, ways that they are fantastically um, diverse and integral habitats and, and some, some good examples of, of key species that utilize them, particularly within the Devon landscape. So what actually makes a hedgerow? Well, essentially it is just a densely planted strip of woody vegetation so that can contain trees and shrub species. Um, and they're an integral part of the British landscape and they have been for centuries. Uh, so initially strips of woodland would have uh, defined boundaries um, and keep stock livestock contained. Um, so historically um, hedgerows followed suite with that. They're very functional, um, marked boundaries. Um, again, created stockproof barriers were there for uh, a source of firewood, also providing shelter from wind, from rain, um, from sun, not just for cro arable crops, but also for the livestock themselves as well. So many of our hedgerows are hundreds of years old and some of the systems um, in place that the hedgerows um, are set along do date back to prehistoric times. So very culturally significant. And a lot of hedgerows were, um, were planted up uh, during the Enclosure Acts, um, so between 1750 and 1850, to help compartmentalise land and lock land up um, uh, and, and reflect ownership boundaries. So people really relied on uh, hedgerow systems for their livelihoods. And for, for a long, long time, agriculture worked really successfully and closely alongside nature and the wildlife on our farmlands really thrived because of that. So the oldest known, known hedgerow surviving in England is around 900 years old. So that's Judith's Hedge in Cambridgeshire. Um, and in Devon, um, over a quarter of our hedges here are actually over 800 years old. So it's quite significant in this county for, um, for ancient hedgerows. So there are hedgerows kind of fall into two main categories. So you have managed hedgerow, hedgerows and relic hedgerows. So you can see the images there help to illustrate those. So at the top, we see a managed hedgerow. And by what, what we mean by that is where trees um, no longer take their natural shape, they are being managed in some form. And a relic hedgerow at the bottom there, um, where trees were initially planted as hedges, um, but haven't been subject to management at all or for some time. Um, so they've grown up um, and, and they still reflect that, that linear composition, but obviously resemble um, the trees themselves. So thinking about um, hedgerows and their diversity that they offer in, within the landscape, well, they've got huge wildlife potential. They play such an incredibly important role in the health and diversity of our land. And also, as I've mentioned, our cultural heritage and farming traditions. So they're actually our U the UK's largest priority habitat, which most people don't realize. Um, they often are found slotted into farmland, which covers over 60% of all UK land. So they, you know, they really have been very prevalent. Um, they're there to connect habitats and act as key linear, linear features. They obviously provide 
really important nesting and sheltering opportunities um, and a plentiful forage resource as well for so many different species. And that's all whilst um, mitigating the impacts of climate change and offering such a, a suite of ecosystem services, everything from preventing soil loss and water runoff, um, carbon storage, um, food and materials, medicinal use, etc. So hedgerows are vitally important for wildlife. They support uh, up to 80% of our woodland bird species and a huge number of invertebrates, mammals, including um, European protected species, such as the hazel dormouse and, and bat species, and, and many others um, in addition to those. Um, and they are protected under the hedgerows regulations, um, which were um, formed in 19, only in 1997. Um, so this protection is, um, is useful, but it has its limitations. So essentially it means that landowners must uh, inform the local authorities if they want to remove what is deemed an important hedgerow. So essentially that's a hedgerow that's over uh, 20 metres long or adjoins another hedgerow. Um, but obviously, yeah, that's a very subjective um, importance that, that can be placed upon those. And that, that obviously does um, create some problems in terms of um, hedgerow protection. So thinking about uh, threats and losses that have impacted our hedgerows over, over the centuries, um, we know that we are we ha have lost a lot of hedgerows and, and continue to do so, although we are now gradually seeing um, an uptake in, in new planting, which is, is positive. And um, there are schemes and incentives to support um, hedgerow establishment and management as well, which is, is a positive thing. So there are around 400,000 kilometres of what we call managed hedgerows in England. And then another 145,000 kilometres of linear features. So as you remember from the earlier slide, talking about those relic hedgerows um, and, and lines of trees where they've been allowed to grow up. So we have lost around 50% of our hedgerows since World War II. So a huge amount. Uh, and many of those were removed um, to widen fields for food production um, to make way for buildings. And in addition to the hedgerows, we've also seen, um, you know, quite a loss of our, our traditional orchards and our hay meadows um, as well. So in 1998 to 2007, that, that downward trend continues and we see um, a hedgerows decreasing by 6.1% just in, in those few short years. Um, and then the 2007 countryside survey found that less than half of all existing hedgerows uh, were in good condition. So those that we do have that still persist aren't necessarily being managed in, in the most beneficial way. Um, the 1998 countryside survey, a 40% decrease of hedgerow trees. Um, so we will cover hedgerow trees later on in the presentation. They're really key features of our hedgerows, incredibly important for wildlife. Um, and we're seeing that less and less of those are being planted and nurtured. Um, so 40% decrease in those between one and four years old and a decrease in overall numbers as well since 1990. So um, the conditions that I mentioned, they're assessed by um, the steering group for UK British agricultural policy for hedgerows, um, <laughs> who initially um, would assess hedgerow condition on things like integrity, uh, continuity, the size, um, whether the ground beneath those was undisturbed. So there are a lot of reasons why um, our hedgerows are threatened. So I've got highlighted some uh, on the right hand side of the slide there. So uh, obviously the intensification of agriculture is, is one of the biggest factors why, why those hedgerows are threatened and lost. Um, so also things like over management, um, so hedges being cut at the same height every year, um, the bottom of those hedges becomes gappy and eventually causes the hedges to fail. They lose their wildlife value um, and uh, essentially, yeah, just um, become um, a, a poor resource. Um, also poorly timed management of hedgerows can hugely impact the, the species that use them. And, and neglect as well, so kind of the opposite, um, hedges that are, that are left that, that end up just growing up as, as a line of gappy trees, although there is still wildlife value retained in the canopy, 
the really important um, basal area of those hedgerows, that all of the vitality and, and, and um, positive things that are offered to wildlife are, are lost when, when that um, habitat becomes, becomes lost through trees growing up. So we also see um, hedgerows being rubbed out. So that essentially means landowners are digging the roots out um, of those hedges, uh, sometimes to replace them entirely with fencing, which is often seen as a, as a much cheaper and easier um, option uh, for creating stock-proof fields or, or boundary lines. And also there are issues with uh, chemical spray drift as well from agricultural practices impacting um, the, the plants that grow within the hedgerow, the trees, uh, the invertebrates in particular that rely on them. We know that many um, herbicides can interact synergistically with other pesticides and, and really exemplify the impacts of those for a lot of species. Um, so yeah, but not, not good news for the hedgerows and the species that use them. However, yeah, so many benefits that we still see from our hedgerows um, that are persisting, such fantastic um, hubs for wildlife. They're often the only link between wooded areas and other isolated patches of wildlife habitat, which are scattered across the landscape. So they're absolutely key in helping species to move between these areas and acting as a wildlife corridor or a commuter route. So species like the hazel dormouse, for example, they really struggle to cross large open areas like farmed fields and incredibly um, rely on hedgerows to be able to, to migrate from one area to another. Uh, obviously, they offer an abundance of forage throughout the year. and We'll look at the hedgerow through the season shortly. Also, shelter and nesting opportunities. Um, just in general, a lot of vegetation and woody habitat is, is incredibly useful for species. The hedgerow trees that I mentioned before um, are really important song posts for a lot of um, bird species and also act as master trees for, for key butterflies. For example, things like uh, purple emperor will use oak um, and brownish hair streak will use ash. Uh, just creating this abundance of um, invertebrates uh, also will boost the food chain. So they're creating a, an important food source for uh, other larger invertebrates, for birds, for mammals. Um, and yeah, they, they really uh, mimic a woodland edge structure. So they, they overlap all of those important elements that you would find within the woodland edge. Um, and um, also en encompass things like scrub and grassland as well. So they're kind of the best of all three of those worlds, the woodland, the scrub and the grassland. Um, all of the species that would, would utilize those features can be found um, along hedgerows. So the really important um, type of hedgerow for wildlife is one that is thick and broad bottomed. <laughs> so uh, they're, they're gonna, that's essentially where the, the main activity and hub of wildlife tends to, tends to focus in the hedge is, is a, in that, that lower area. So I can't stress how important um, having a, a really thick um, and, and vibrant um, abundant hedgerow is. Uh, a lot of woody species will re rely um, on the hedgerow environment. A lot of our shrubs will grow up within that and um, trailing plants such as bramble, honeysuckle, wild roses can all utilize hedgerows um, as, as a base from which to grow. Um, all incredibly important um, nectar and pollen sources. But the, the ground uh, below the hedge is also very important. Um, so thinking about the developing dead wood that will be falling there um, and also any leaf litter as well. Um, so our hedgehogs will use leaf litter beneath the hedgerow environment within which to, um, to shelter. Um, and the ditches and banks can be um, incredibly important bases for things like beetles, um, also um, bumblebees as well. The queens will often find um, nesting holes around the base of hedgerows uh, from which to form their colonies. So there, there's a whole chain of, of, of intricate um, uh, relationships that are going on within that hedgerow environment. So our hedgerows are really vital habitat for many of our priority species. So it's believed that over 2,000 species will use the hedgerows in general, 
uh, many generalist species, but also some of our more specialist um, wildlife as well. So over 130 biodiversity action plan species will use hedgerows, and that includes European protected, protected species. So as I mentioned earlier, the hazel dormouse, um, a number of, of bats, uh, great crested newts even will use um, hedgerows to forage for invertebrates or for shelter. Um, so priority for conservation species essentially means that they're very vulnerable and very localized and rare. Um, and often um, in losing the hedgerows, we, we risk um, those, the, the, those species and they become much more vulnerable without a hedgerow environment. So eight, a, quite a big number really, 80% of our woodland birds will use hedges. Um, it's priority habitat for 12 threatened bird species as well. Um, so that includes things like sow buntings, which are obviously one of our prominent um, South Devon species. Uh, species like house and tree sparrows, bullfinches and dunnocks, linnets, uh, song thrushes, turtle doves, willow tits, yellow hammers. So, so quite a range of, of different birds will use those hedgerows and also the different heights of, of the hedgerow um, for, uh, for nesting opportunities as well. Uh, so 50% of our mammals, so over 20 uh, mammal species will use um, hedgerows and over 30% of our butterflies as well. There's actually 1,500 invertebrates um, that can be found within the hedgerow environment and over 600 plants that will grow uh, beneath or within hedgerows. So yeah, just look at those stats and it shows you just how incredibly important they are. So this is a really nice infographic that's um, provided by the People's Trust for Endangered Species. So it helps to show you um, all of the different um, species that will use the hedgerow throughout different times of the year, basing um, on you know, what, what forage is available. So for everything from blossom to, to nuts and fruits, um, also uh, vegetation for, for shelter, for um, roosting opportunities. So we'll look at that in a little bit more detail. So here we've got um, a bit more information about hedgerows throughout the seasons. So in spring, um, the hawthorn, um, so this will always show its leaves first um, and the blackthorn um, will always blossom first. So you've got an image of the blackthorn blossom there. So that can come out as early as February or March time. Um, so that's an incredibly important pollen resource for uh, many of our early pollinating species, things like um, buff-tailed bumblebee, for example, which can have overwinter colonies that are active. Um, they really rely on things like blackthorn blossom for their nectar and pollen forage. And goat willow catkins as well, again, another really important early pollen source. And, and the thorns and the goat willow can be really integral um, hedgerow plants, uh, so I previously worked in Kent and many of our hedgerows there, those three species really um, were dominant and um, yeah, inc incredibly important for, for many early pollinators. Uh, so developing nesting and shelter for birds. So the birds will start breeding in as early as February, really, um, although we tend to say from March onwards. So those hedgerow environments are crucial for, for nesting and shelter but also the developing flora beneath the hedgerow and along bank sides as well. That's starting to, to come through in the spring and uh, yeah, providing important um, resource for a number of species. So in the summer, we've got a nice image there of um, predominantly hazel hedgerow with some foxgloves and other herbaceous vegetation growing up underneath the hedge. So things like hawthorn will produce their haws in late summer. Brambles, which are incredibly um, important species, uh, will be flowering and then producing their fruit from July onwards. So um, having done a lot of um, bee and butterfly surveying, it's, yeah, brambles are one of the absolute key uh, plants for those species at that time of year. Uh, a lot of birds might be having second roots, so abundant foliage uh, will be, be providing protection and forage for those species. Um, things like elder, the berries will start to, start to ripen in August um, and the, the hedgerow will just be alive with invertebrates. 
Again, you've got lots of flora growing at the base of the hedge um, and lots of tussocky vegetation, lots of coarse grasses as well, which again, as I said before, is, is really important for, for beetles and bumblebees and nesting material for, for birds as well. So in the autumn, um, I've got a nice image there of uh, Gelder Rose, which is yeah, such a fantastic autumn um, hedgerow shrub. It's really vibrant, turns that beautiful shade of, of orangey pink and those bright red berries as well, which are, are useful for a lot of birds. So it's a key time for them to be foraging for, for different nuts and berries and things like blackthorn will be producing sloes as well. Hazel, the nuts will start to ripen in September to October. So that's going to be key for dormice to, uh, to, to utilize those. The elderberries will be developing, crab apple, and also it's a key time for fungi. Fungi is out all year round, different species will be, be prevalent throughout the year, but autumn is really the time when, when things really flourish in the fungi world. Um, so any of that dead and decaying wood within hedgerows will be host to, to a number of species. Many will grow at the base of hedgerows as well. And then in the winter, well, our hedges are a real lifeline for wildlife. Uh, the leaf litter, as I said before, um, gathers on the ground and creates important shelter for hedgehogs. Invertebrates will be using the hedge as shelter as well and pupae developing. So, for example, um, a number of moth larvae will actually burrow into um, the stems of, of particular shrubs and trees to overwinter in there. So old hollow stalks are a, a very important resource. Dormice will be hibernating or going into torpor. And um, yeah, it will provide a, an important feeding and roosting site for both resident birds and a lot of winter visitors as well, such as field fairs and red wings. So yeah, just got um, a couple of pictures here to show you um, from a site that I used to work on in Kent. Um, so this is uh, a site that was um, a former arable, um, 140 hectare, um, land and it's being converted into uh, developing uh, wood pasture, over two kilometres of hedgerows put in <clears throat> and also um, planted woodland as well. And this site was alive with birds and pollinators and these hedgerows were really important features for the, those species and you can see here um, there are volunteers that are undertaking um, a bee survey. So we were actually looking for, for rare bees that um, were utilizing a number of the species growing in the hedgerows and also nesting at the base of them. Um, so this is what the hedgerow looked like during the summer. And then in the autumn, you can see below all of the wonderful slow berries on the blackthorn um, starting to develop. So just, yes, yeah, such a fantastically important habitat. <clears throat> So focusing on some of our key Devon species. Um, so we've got the sow bunting here and the brown hair streak. So these um, are both species that are uh, form part of our um, citizen science work as well. So Lindsay um, is our citizen science officer um, and yeah, is supporting volunteers and, and members of the public to, um, to go out and um, survey for these species. So cell buntings are confined to the southwest of England. So they're best looked for in fields and hedges in South Devon. And they tend to be, um, their range tends to be located uh, quite near the coast now as well. They've kind of been, been pushed out to coastal proximities over the last um, few decades. So they're a lowland farmland bird and they have really specific requirements for habitat and climate. So they really need... Um, thorn hedgerows, so blackthorn, hawthorn and, and gorse as well, um, but in close proximity to grass margins um, and also uh, winter stubble. So those three things need to be, be working in conjunction to provide positive habitat for cell bunting. Um, they've really suffered quite a dramatic decline um, in numbers uh, over the past few decades. And they're at the lowest point, they were down to 118 pairs in 1989. So the cause of the population decline was due to changes in farming practices, um, particularly switch of um, autumn sowing of cereals, uh, wide herbicide use as well, but also the, the removal of um, 
hedgerows and uh, song post hedgerow trees. So carefully targeted habitat improvements um, funded by different agri-environment schemes and implemented by farmers and landowners have really helped to support this species um, through advice uh, from, from specialists working for RSPB, Wildlife Trust, etc. cetera. Um, so that's thankfully led to an increase in the cell bunting population. So the last survey count, there were over a thousand pairs. And now there are plans to um, lead a reintroduction scheme into Cornwall as well, which is really positive. Um, but a species that is incredibly reliable on our hedgerow habitats. And brown hair streaks. So on the right there, we have a brown hair streak. Um, so the loss of ash, um, as we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, that's having a really negative effect on our brown hair streaks. For the males use ash, um, master tree, the tree of the males, um, and they also feed on the honeydew that occurs on ash leaves, which is um, caused by aphids. So those hedgerow trees are, are vital for, for brown street butterflies to thrive. They also depend on blackthorn hedges. So the females will lay their eggs on the blackthorn uh, or other members of um, the plum family. Um, so yeah, in conjunction, those, those two things are, are vital. The colonies usually occur at quite low densities over quite a wide area. So it can become, colonies can become fragmented very easily. Um, and they're very impacted by hedge removal and the frequency of cutting as well. So another two key hedgerow reliant species, the hazel dormouse and, and barbastel bats. So as we mentioned before, the dormice are a European protected species. They're incredibly rare and um, vulnerable to extinction in the UK. The total population in the UK is quite unknown, but there has been a long term decline in the number and range, quite largely due to inappropriate hedgerow management. Um, so they're an arboreal species. So unlike other mice, they rely on movement um, throughout branches of, of shrubs. Um, and they're very slow breeders and they, they have a poor dispersal rate. So hedgerows help essentially help them to, to move through the landscape um, between larger areas. They also will use the hedgerow for food. So obviously eating things like hazelnuts um, and uh, shelter as well. And they form these really neat little woven nests, um, often in a mass of bramble or in rejuvenated um, hazel coppice regrowth as well. So their diet will, will change throughout the year. They need things like um, uh, eating oak flowers, hawthorn, sycamore, ash keys, um, also things like species, uh, honeysuckle species and bramble as well. And then later in the year, they'll switch to nuts and berries like blackberries and hazelnuts. So, you know, they're, they're reliant on a diversity of, of different plants and shrubs growing in those hedgerows um, in order to thrive. And if a hedge is supporting hazel dormice, then it will probably be supporting many, many other species because they are so fussy. Um, yeah, you can guarantee that, that other species will be doing well if hazel dormice are persisting in that hedgerow. So barbastel bats, um, so hedgerows and woodland edge um, and ditches can all form key commuting routes for bats um, and they aid with their navigation and provide shelter as well from the wind um, during flight. Hedgerow trees can also provide roosting opportunities and that just that network of well-connected hedgerows and other linear features within landscape allow many species of bat to extend their foraging and roosting capacity. <clears throat> um, also for um, courtship, uh, breeding and feeding, hedgerows are absolutely vital. And for barbastel bats, there's as few as 5,000 uh, in the UK. Um, so yeah, another species that, that could be really uh, impacted if we were to see further hedgerow decline. So looking at tree and shrub species that are important um, and that can be utilized uh, when establishing hedges. Um, so the sort of species that you'll see in our rural hedges might be very different to those that you'd find in an urban hedge. 
Um, so in rural hedges, well, it could be a whole variety of things, anything from hawthorn, which is our most common um, hedgerow species, uh, blackthorn, spindle, hazel, uh, ash, oak, field maple, hornbeam. And then in uh, urban hedges, you might find more um, species like box or privet or yew or holly or beech. So they're good um, shelter, good privacy um, created from, from those trees, obviously some evergreens in there as well. So that might be dictated more by, um, you know, what people want to get out of their hedge. Um, but again, they can offer, it might be slightly more limited, but they can offer um, important um, habitat requirements for, for a number of species. So if you're wanting to um, plant a hedge and you're thinking about tree and shrub selection, um, local context is, is really important. Um, so diversity is obviously really, really beneficial, but you want to be choosing species that grow within the local landscape, um, just to ensure that they're really well suited to local environmental conditions, soil type, um, and the potential to support the wildlife that would thrive in that area as well. So um, placement, when we um, advise people on, on hedge creation, uh, we tend to suggest a staggered double row of around five trees per meter. Um, and that's to just allow the trees enough, enough room to, to grow up, but for them to still be um, sort of fairly tightly knitted. Uh, also, I would suggest planting um, in groups of three to five to support establishment. If you think if, if key wildlife species are relying on a particular shrub or tree species, if you have a few of those in close proximity to one another, it really supports the development of, of that wildlife species and, and their movement um, within, that, within that hedgerow as well. And it's so important to have standard trees um, within the mix. So for a lot of agri-environment scheme um, requirements, um, it would be a minimum of one hedgerow tree every 100 metres, but we really want far more than that. So, you know, at least um, every 30 to 40 metres, if not more. And they're, they're going to be those important um, structural components, um, offering uh, song post opportunities as master trees, et cetera. So the hedgerow trees that are within the mix, their canopies would be managed separately to the rest of the hedge, um, but there's opportunities to look um, to put in shrubs below those that can cope with shade, so things like holly or hazel, um, or to consider trees um, planted in as hedgerow trees that have cast light shade, um, particularly on farmsteads and things where there might be concerns about um, shading of crops or something like that. Um, so you could look to plant species such as cherries or rowans. So yeah, the species that don't cast quite as dense a um, shady area. So looking at the life cycle and management of a hedgerow, um, we do need to consider our hedgerows as living systems and a healthy, well-structured hedge. So that basically means a hedge that is dense and thick and bushy will always offer a maximum um, benefits for wildlife. So primarily the density should be in the base, so that's key for, for nesting birds, for mammals, etc. But ca the canopy biodiversity is, is still really important as well. Um, so hedges need to be managed flexibly, uh, taking into account of their lifestyle. New hedges, as they're establishing, can be lightly pruned back to promote layered growth. That helps them to thicken them up, to retain their shape. Um, and they can be trimmed um, regularly, little and often, um, just to, um, to help them form that, that nice thick bushiness that we want to see. Um, but the ideal really is for that to eventually be done every other year or even every third year. So that really allows for, um, for blossom and fruit to prevail. So many of those species um, won't start um, fruiting and blossoming into the second year of the cycle. Um, so it just allows the opportunity for that and to support wildlife species through those things. Um, trimming in late winter instead of autumn allows a hedgerow to retain what we know as its larder status. So that's its kind of uh, opportunities that it provides for wildlife um, with the, the, the fruit and nuts that are on offer. Um, and if they are um, 
if there's potential to allow them to increase in size every time they're trimmed, that's really positive as well. As I've said before, a bigger and better and more complex hedge will develop and that's that's going to be the most effective for wildlife. Now, there are um, obviously times where um, hedgerows will need to be subject to annual flailing. So that's where hedgerows might grow along uh, road edges and there are prescriptions in place that highways will, will you know, say they need to be cut back every every year. And that that if that has to happen, that should be done, obviously, outside of bird nesting season. Um, but it does need to be done with care. Any flailing work um, needs to be, be done with a lot of thought in mind. So for a lot of farmers, it can be a cost effective option and it obviously does do a good pruning job. Um, but we know that it's not that it's not always been done in a way that's beneficial for, for wildlife. Um, cutting every year to the same height has really ne negative effects um, for the hedge and its value for wildlife as well. It, it essentially threatens the integrity of the hedge, um, losing its structure, density at the base, um, plant stems will be lost and it, it just becomes a sort of really gappy um, understory. So the best way to um, rejuvenate and manage hedges for wildlife is to eventually look to lay them. So if they're left unmanaged, they will eventually turn into a line of trees. Um, and as I said before, they'll create quite gappy hedges that will support less species. Um, but laying or, or coppicing, if, if that's the better option, does keep their life cycle turning um, and helps just helps to rejuvenate that growth. So in terms of hedge laying, it's, it's uh, traditionally the way that hedges probably would have been managed. Uh, they would have been laid every 15 to 20 years uh, just to keep them thick and healthy um, and, and promote their longevity. So species such as hazel might be done a bit more regularly than that. So maybe even as, as little as every seven years, um, just to increase um, the life cycle of the tree. And it, it basically keeps them in a juvenile state. So they're constantly um, producing this, this young virulent growth. So laying, um, if you're not aware of, of what that is, it involves basically partially cutting through the stems of the hedge. Um, laying them over and weaving them together to create um, a thick barrier. Wooden stakes are then inserted at various intervals to give support and um, binders are woven in and out of the stakes to help secure everything. So you can just see some of those in place in, in that photo. Um, eventually the stakes and the binders will uh, break down and the cut stems uh, will reshoot and continue to grow up into a new mass of, of hedgerow vegetation. And that cycle will continue every every few years um, just to, to continually rejuvenate and, and keep that hedge nice and thick and, and positive for wildlife. Uh, hedge laying is best carried out in uh, late winter, so before nesting season, but after most of the berries and other forage has been eaten over the winter period. Um, so sometimes coppicing might be a better option for um, hedgerow management. Um, so that is involving cutting the stems right down to ground level and allowing those stools to reshoot and regrow, um, as obviously we do with, with elements of, of our woodland uh, management cycle as well. So it's a really useful technique for rejuvenation for hedges that have uh, don't have very many stems to lay, or maybe they're a bit too large or they're rotten and it's not looking quite so healthy. It's also really useful for wide hedgerows as well. Um, and it does allow uh, landowners the opportunity to gap up um, and create a really thick, dense hedgerow that will reform in a few years. But any of this, this regrowth does need to be protected from browsing. So deer obviously can be an issue with um, munching down coppice regrowth, um, but also things like rabbits as well um, will quite happily um, munch on that and, um, and cause problems for the tree reshooting. So there are options uh, to, to prevent that from happening. So in, quite often in woodland coppicing, you would use um, the brash, so the material that's cut from, from the stems, from the trees, um, and lay that over the stools to try and, and prevent um, browsing off of the, the shoots as they come through. Um, but also quite simply fencing some coppice hedges um, 
that could provide um, a solution uh, to try and keep herbivore browsing uh, down to a minimum. There are um, potential opportunities for uh, landowners to manage hedges um, sensitively for um, biofuel. So um, using the cut wood uh, for local energy or heat production. And that could be one way to ensure that that, that cycle is maintained and, and valued. But also hedge laying is just such a fantastic um, engagement opportunity. Um, it's great for volunteers to, to get stuck in with and involved with, and for members of lo the local community who perhaps you know, haven't understood why a hedge would go through this process. It can look quite stark when it's first done and it, you know, it, it might look like quite a detrimental thing. Um, some people might not, not understand the benefits of it. So I've got some images here of um, hedge laying works that were undertaken last year um, on a couple of sites. Um, so in the middle there, we've got some volunteers um, down at Breed Wood in uh, East Sussex. Um, and then uh, on either side, um, a recently laid hedge at Victory Wood in Kent. Um, and yeah, the reasons for laying these hedges, not only the fantastic wildlife um, benefits from it and creating a nice thick environment, but also on these sites to help retain views across, across that area of the landscape as well, and a stock proof barrier. So this is the Midland um, style hedge laying. So there's lots of different styles. I think something like over 30 different styles within the UK that are, that are used and they tend to be quite, quite regional and they'll suit different needs of the land where, where the laying is taking place. Um, but here, these, yeah, these are really creating um, quite key stock proof barriers that will prevent, um, you know, cattle uh, in particular from, from being able to move uh, between compartments. So the real key to any hedge work is planning a piecemeal approach and piecemeal action. Um, so where there are multiple hedges across the site or within close proximity to one another, it's always a good approach to try and promote um, a different variety of heights and structure. And that will always um, have the best impacts for wildlife. Some could even be left to grow up as small shores or thickets. And, and within the mix that will offer a nice um, range of habitats for different species. Uh, dead hedging as well is, a, is another really important habitat for wildlife um, called a dead hedge, but it's full of life. Um, so these are created, um, these were created on woodland sites um, with arisings from coppicing and tree work. So again, uh, wooden stakes are, are put in the ground and all the cutoffs, the arisings from the tree works are stacked within those. Um, <clears throat> really useful shelter hiding places, nesting habitats for all sorts of creatures. Um, and they can be topped up. So that's that's really useful um, as, as works continue to take place. Um, they can just continually be topped up with more material and the, the, the material at the bottom will rot down into the ground and the nutrients are recycled back into the earth. <clears throat> um, these also uh, just, yeah, create very good people barriers. So if you don't want people getting into certain areas of the site um, and, and also um, potentially uh, deer, uh, acting as a deer fence as well, if, if they're, they're built up high enough. So now just looking at hedgerow standard trees. So we mentioned these earlier. Um, so these are a really integral part of a hedgerow um, and really, really important for a number of species. They've got huge biodiversity value. They offer shelter, food, nesting sites, and song posts as well, um, particularly for things like cell bunting, as I mentioned before. And they're also uh, stepping stones between woodlands. As they develop and they age, you'll be um, seeing much more decaying in deadwood habitats. That's fantastic for a number of saprozylic, so wood decay um, invertebrate species that will rely on more open, um, decaying wood um, trees. Um, they're also just the most important structural component of a hedgerow for a number of our threatened species. So many of our hedgerow trees are um, ash and oak. So I think something like 29% of our hedgerow trees um, it, back in the 80s were ash. 
Obviously, a number of those are being lost um, due to dieback. Some of those are being taken down um, because of their proximity to roadside <clears throat> or public rights of way. So, and, and successors aren't necessarily being planted up. So there are incentives through uh, countryside uh, stewardship and agro-environment schemes to um, ensure that there is a successor generation of uh, hedgerow standard trees, <clears throat> it replacing things like lost ash. Um, and also they obviously offer a no huge number of ecosystem services, things like shade, um, all, the, all the benefits that, that any of our trees would offer. So as I said before, um, as our hedgerow trees are um, suffering with lack of succession um, and only a, a third of our hedgerow trees now are over a century old. Um, they can be seen by landowners as being quite problematic and costly and time consuming to manage. Um, so often they are dismantled prematurely and, and removed from hedgerows. Um, so they are succumbing to disease. As I mentioned, ash dieback, elm was another key um, hedgerow tree as well. Um, and a study, yes, this is a study in the 1980s. So, um, so it's 36% were ash and 29% oak. So there's, there's not always much diversity within, within those hedgerow tree species. Um, so as part of our work, we are saving Devon's treescapes. Um, we promote uh, benefits of tree tagging hedgerow trees. Um, so this essentially safeguards them for wildlife um, and for people. <clears throat> the tags that we use are really visible um, and help to ensure that those trees aren't flailed or cut back if any, any management of the hedge does take place. Um, and this is something that is also um, promoted through um, SFI, so Sustainable Farming Incentive as well. Um, that offers uh, farmers and landowners payments to, uh, to plant and retain and nurture hedgerow trees. Um, so through this, we can really try and ensure a selection of diversity of species um, in the successor generation. There's an opportunity to nurture local species such as Devon whitebeam. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just a really positive way to engage with landowners and volunteers. Um, getting them out there, looking at the trees that they have growing in their hedgerows, understanding how important they are for, for wildlife and um, yeah, just general tree ID opportunities as well. Um, and if people will pass these trees, they see tags on them, that they're going to want to know what they're for, what they represent. So just general awareness raising with, uh, with the public about the importance of hedgerow trees and the different species. So I have put on here some, um, hopefully some useful links um, if you want to do a bit more research around um, hedgerows. Um, and if you're thinking about planting your own hedgerow or um, going out and, and get, just getting to know your local hedgerows. Um, so Hedgelink um, brings different organisations together and just raises awareness and shares best practice uh, regarding the UK's hedgerows. Um, and there's the link there, uh, Devon Hedge Group as well as a really active um, hedge group uh, within the county. So there might be opportunities for you to attend a hedge laying day if you're interested in that or go and um, survey for wildlife within the hedgerows. They often do things like moth trapping events, for example. I think there's one, maybe might have been on Saturday or it's next Saturday. Um, so yeah, go onto the website and, and see what, what events are happening. Um, also, People Tr People's Trust for Endangered Species, Woodland Trust, RSPB, Bumblebee Conservation Trust, they all offer um, different advisory uh, sheets and um, information on how to manage hedgerows and the benefits that they provide for the key species that they, they support. Um, and if you want to get really nerdy about it, you can go on to ResearchGate and, and have a look through some of the, the papers on there. Um, and just to see the kind of up-to-date research that's happening around um, hedgerows and the biodiversity benefits of them. <clears throat> There's also on social media quite a lot of um, interesting um, hedge-related accounts. So on Instagram, West Country Hedge Layer and Hedgeways um, and the National Hedge Laying Society 
um, all offer quite regular updates and interesting snippets and facts about um, hedge management. Um, and Chris Packham is um, a big um, hedger advocate. So he um, has been running a hedger of the year competition for at least a couple of years now um, and encouraging people to get out there um, take pictures of their local hedge, a good example of a hedge. Sadly, some, some not so good examples get shared around as well. Um, and yeah, just to get people more engaged and interested in their local hedgerow. And then as a project, we also have a number of ways for people to get involved. As I mentioned before, um, we do um, hedgerow tree tagging. So there's potential for volunteers to support that. Obviously, landowner permissions need to be in place. Um, but aside from, from hedgerows, there are a lot of different ways that volunteers can support our work. Everything from volunteering at our local community tree nurseries. So we now have two, one at Meath and one at Broadclist, um, helping with seed collection. <clears throat> Um, planting trees from our tr uh, free tree schemes, um, leading community planting events and supporting those. Um, also supporting our citizen science work as well and collect data on ash dieback, uh, notable trees and key species that will use those hedgerows, things like cell bunting, um, bats and hazel dormice. Um, <clears throat> we always encourage people to share any photos that they take on social media with the hashtag save Devon's trees and yeah just keep an eye out on the website basically for any opportunities um, and uh, yeah for something that interests you then please do get in touch. Thanks, Claire. That was a really interesting talk. You managed to cover a huge range of topics there in, in that hour. We are now just past seven o'clock, so I'm conscious that some people may have to leave because we did say that this is going to go on until seven o'clock, but we will just uh, spend five minutes or so. Um, so do hang around if you can and join us for questions and answers. So apologies in advance that we won't be able to get through all of your questions, but thank you to those of you who have submitted them. And I hope that some of your questions have already been answered by Claire um, as she continued with her presentation. So thanks very much for your attention. If you have to leave us now, thank you so much. Uh, we will send up a follow up, follow up email with some of those links that Claire's mentioned, and you can also rewatch this presentation or just dip into it to find the bits that are relevant to you um, on our YouTube channel from probably tomorrow or the day after. So some questions, Claire. Um, there's some interest in um, what the flailing element of hedges and whether farmers or landowners are either get paid to flail or not to flail. Are there sort of subsidies or grants available for preserving hedgerows? I think you alluded to planting hedgerow trees there. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so there's... <clears throat> financial incentives um, agri-environment scheme grants in place for um, positive hedgerow management so um, SFI uh, payments and countryside stewardship payments so there are options within those for um, capital items so things like um, hedgerow gapping up and coppicing and um, planting um, hedgerow trees so all really positive things um, but management of hedgerows um so that that is um an ongoing payment that does um support um cutting or or uh, a flailing of hedgerows on a much reduced scale so looking at every two to three years as an absolute maximum um and that should be done with um with wildlife incentives in mind so ensuring that it's not um hitting the hedge too hard that it's um retaining that nice bushy undergrowth um keeping a peak of, of canopy not impacting hedgerow trees um so the payments are there to try and incentivize farmers and landowners to be really considered and, and thoughtful in their approach to to hedgerow management and uh, yeah to not to not be over managing those hedges um but also to be you know to to not be neglecting them at the same time so yeah the the um those those payments are, are really encouraging and and 
the SFI payment in particular is, is you know, a, a positive development. Um, we could potentially see more to incentivize um, farmers and landowners to, um, you know, to take things even to the next step. But yeah, they're, they're, it's definitely on a positive trajectory um, and, and certainly isn't encouraging um, landowners to, yeah, to just be hard flailing every single year. That's, that's definitely not something that we want to see. Great, thank you. And in terms of sort of the overall landscape and whether we're seeing more hedges or whether hedges are still being removed, do you have a an idea of whether that that situation is so the, the absence or presence of hedgerows across the land is is getting better or worse? Are they still yeah. being removed? Yeah, so we are we're seeing lots more hedges being planted. So that's really positive. So that is um, you know, there's more incentives now for for agriculture and um, nature and wildlife to be to be in harmony um, and for farmers to be much more considered in their approach um, so yeah lots of lots of planting opportunities going on I mean we see with our project alone there's it, it's we're always oversubscribed for for trees for hedgerow and crops planting on, on farms and and small holdings um, so that's really that's really good news um, I think there's yes, yeah, so we've got these he hedgerow regulations in place um, that do prevent farmers and landowners from from removing or grubbing out hedgerows that are over a certain um, size, over 20 meters, obviously, uh, and, and what are deemed important hedgerows. So obviously that can be kind of subjective and there, there have been issues with that. And that does need to really be a bit more robust um, and, and, and to give greater um, protection there to to those habitats um but i think yeah the people are becoming much more aware of, of of monitoring these things and and um advocating for their local hedgerows and i think that that pressure and that awareness raising has, has also been really positive you know it's getting people to to look in to check in on things to report things if something doesn't feel quite right um to share best practice and, and positive examples and and yeah hopefully that that momentum will continue and um yeah things will improve great that sounds like a good news story <laughs> um so along with that there's been a question about once hedgerows are removed if they are replanted can the can the wildlife bounce back basically or what's what's the time lag if there is one about whether it can bounce back yeah well I mean, no new hedgerow is going to replace an ancient or, or old hedgerow. Uh, the same with, with our trees. We know that if we, we cut down an ancient or veteran tree, a newly planted tree in its place, is, is just not going to have the same impact. Um, but that's not to suggest that, that that shouldn't be done if, if you know, those, those situations have already taken place. Um, it's nice to, to restore, to seek opportunities to restore lost hedgerows. Um, where they have unfortunately come out. Um, obviously, yeah, it's going to take time for certain species to re-establish, particularly some of those slower moving, slower migrating species. Um, but that's not to say that we shouldn't, yeah, attempt to to recreate what was what was lost and um, go from there. Great. Um, some of our Devon friends have been pleased to note the, the number of old hedgerows that still exist in Devon. But when we're talking about hedgerows that are over 800 years old, are we referring to the banks that may still be there? Presumably it's not the same trees and shrubs. So how, how does that work? Yeah, yeah. So a hedgerow, like the, the term would encompass the banks and and the the soils and yeah the kind of surroundings beneath that hedgerow as well so when we when we classify our older hedgerows our ancient hedgerows it is going to include those features so yeah it could it could be that um the, obviously the shrubs and trees have grown have, have come and gone um but the 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 kind of the boundary of that hedgerow remains the integrity of the bank and 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 the base of that hedgerow is still persisting so that that network and that that formation is still there so that's definitely going to be included in those figures um for those that are over 800 years old for sure super thanks for clearing that up um, one final question, I think, and that is what, what are your top tips for improving a hedgerow that might be gappy at the bottom um, and and maybe the shrub layer next to it? Or yes. The field edge? 
So um, obviously, as we've mentioned in the presentation, laying and coppicing are really key management techniques to promote longevity of a hedge and to really rejuvenate it and re-thicken from the base up because you're promoting that that growth from the, from the stools and from the stems. Um, so those are two options. And the one that you would go with kind of depend on, on the hedge itself and the, the situation itself. Um, those that are very gappy and, and don't have many stems to work with might work better from being coppiced. Um, that also would allow some opportunity to um, gap up the hedge, so to potentially plant within the gaps. Um, but if there's, yeah, if there's good seed source there, then, and you know, uh, even if there's browsing pressure, you can look to, to fence off areas of, of gappy hedgerow, and um, that would support the opportunity for natural regeneration to establish in those gaps. Um, might need a bit of support with some supplementary planting as well, or maybe to just um, bolster a bit of species diversity within that, that particular hedge. Um, and that could be a really good way to, to promote um, regrowth in those areas. Um, if there's, you know, if there's many hedges within, within um, close proximity to one another, there's not always going to necessarily be a need to, um, to do that to every single hedge. Some could be left as to grow up as small shores and thickets. Um, yeah, but the, the approach is really to try and um, to just take things in a very piecemeal way um, and ensure there's, there's a good structural diversity throughout. Thank you, Claire. Thanks so much for sharing your expertise and knowledge with us this evening. Um, I hope that's been of interest to everyone and thank you very much for joining us.